you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. We have quite a bit of scripture that we're going to work through today, so we won't have one particular passage that we'll read together. Uh, but uh, 1 Kings chapter 19 is where we are going to spend our time uh, today. I do want to say thank you for your prayers. I am not feeling the best today, so uh, we're going to ask that God show up in a mighty way. Amen. Amen. Uh, and so uh, we're going we're gonna to expect him to do that. Uh, last week we began a series based on Matthew 1.23, uh, which reads, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And as we talked about last week, God is with us in our valleys, in those difficult moments of life when we're... Uh, we're going through a trial, we're going through some hardship, we're going through a, a point in life where we just weren't anticipating, we're depressed, maybe we're lonely, maybe these are some dark moments that have creeped into our life. We know that God is with us. And we are human, so we all go through valleys, yeah. right? Yeah. We all go through difficulties and we go, all go through these hardships. But I want to encourage you and remind you that in the midst of those hardships, God is with us. This morning, we're going to look at how God is with us through the wilderness. And some of you may be asking, well, what's the difference between a valley and what's the difference in a wilderness? And we're going to talk about that here in just a moment. But I want you to understand that it's very common that whenever we experience mountaintop moments, when we experience the great portions of life, there is also or there's often, I should say, a wilderness moment waiting for us as we come off the side of that mountain. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in just a little while. But before we get too deep into our message, stand with me one more time, I promise. And we'll pray and we'll ask God to continue to help us today. Lord, I thank you for these moments and I thank you for the opportunity that you've allowed us to be here in your presence. And God, as we look through this scripture out of 1 Kings chapter 19, as we talk about Elijah and God, what you did for him and how you showed up in, the, uh, in this awesome story, God, I just ask that you would help us to understand that you are with us in our wilderness moments in life. God, I ask that uh, as I preach today that, Father, it's more of your words and less of mine. Father, more of your thoughts and less of mine, God. And we want ultimately more of you and less of, of us. God, we ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So again, mountaintop experiences, as great as they are and as hopeful as we are that we have more of those in the difficult moments of life, they are often followed by wilderness Moments And so what does the scripture say about the wilderness? How does the scripture describe what the wilderness is? I want you to understand that there are two real descriptions uh, about the wilderness, if you will, as referred to in the scripture. One is it's an actual physical place. Uh, wilderness, when we read in the scripture that, uh, for instance, the prodigal son, which we'll reference here in just a little while as well, when there was a famine in the land, he was in a wilderness. It was a desolate place. It was a, 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 a place where crops didn't grow well, if at all. There were famines that would take place in the world. And, and these are actually uh, dry places, uncultivated land in some instances. Most of the time, they were unoccupied spaces. They were considered land to be waste because you couldn't really do uh, a lot uh, on this land. The other definition of a wilderness is represented by an actual state of being. And some of you are probably all too familiar with that than you would like to be. Uh, a state of being when, again, we're in the midst of a trial or a hardship or more likely, which we'll discuss today, a time of wondering, right? Uh, not W-O-N-D, but W-A-N-D, uh, a time of, of wondering, uh, trying to figure out what your call might be in life or trying to figure out uh, what direction that God may be pointing you or uh, whatever it may be. Again, a good example of this is, is the prodigal son when he had squandered away, the scripture says, all of his inheritance, right? He, he goes to his dad and he says, dad, I want what's owed to me. And what does the father do? Gives it away willingly. And then what does that son do? And this is something that we miss, but the, 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 the father, when he gave away his portion of his son's inheritance, he doesn't get any of that back, right? 
No matter how much his son wants to give back to him or no matter how much of that possession, whatever it is that he, the worth, the value of that, that he wants back, he doesn't get that back. He willingly gives that away, right? That's big. That's a big portion of that scripture that we need to be reminded of. So he, he gives that portion away to his, his, to his son, his inheritance he gives to his, to his son, if you will. And his son squanders it away in wild living, the scripture says. And he gets to a point and the prodigal son actually says that my father's hired servants are living better than I am. So what does he do? He says, I'm going to go back to my dad. The scripture says, why? He's a long way off. He's sitting there searching. He's, he's waiting for his son to come home. The father meets him halfway. But that is a very real sense or illustration, if you will, of a state of being. Uh, that The son was 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 wondering what to do next. Or he knew what to do next, but sometimes he didn't want to do what he needed to do. Can I get an amen? amen. It's most of us, right? Yeah. We know we don't feel good, but we don't go to the doctor. Mm. Way to go, Charlie, right? There's just things that we, we wonder about. There's wondering that takes place. So some of these mountaintop experiences, at least in my life, and I've kind of shared with you before, some of the, 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 the awesome experiences that I've had the joy of, of being a part of, camps were one of those things. I love camp growing up. And again, I'm not going to go into detail. I could talk about camps all day long from the moment I remember my mom going with me at kids camp to me helping at youth camp I, throughout the years. Camps have always been great mountaintop experiences for me because I'm not the one doing the teaching. I'm being talked to. Amen? There's something special about that. Well, I have somebody pouring into me and somebody uh, expressing their, their love uh, that Jesus has for me and some scripture that's being revealed to me. God works in those. Those are mountaintop experiences for me. Uh, revivals. And some of you know what I mean by that. We used to have these week-long revivals. I remember that when I was a kid, right? God would come in. Lady would come in for a whole week. Dad would say, we're going to church tonight. I'd say, Dad, we just went last night. He said, I know, and we're going tomorrow night too. Said, come on, Dad. That's a lot of church. It's a lot of church. Those were good moments. Again, somebody pouring into us. The scripture, the Holy Spirit pouring into us for those moments. And again, those camp moments. When I grew up in Louisiana, well, when I was a kid, we didn't have cell phones. Uh, but the internet there is not that great. And so you, you were disconnected, if you will, from the world around you. I loved it. Same thing with these revival services. Uh, people would come. Again, when I was a kid, people didn't have cell phones like they did now. And so they actually had to sit there and listen to what the guy was saying. Amen. Woo! With no cell phones. Amen. Amen. Those were great experiences where you could push out all the distractions and focus on God. Conferences. Sierra and I have been to some amazing conferences. Church planner conferences and leadership conferences and pastor conferences, youth ministry conferences. And I, I love every scene. I'm just like, it's like a water hose and I'm just trying to suck it all in, right? It's just, I'm, I'm trying to take notes and my handwriting is terrible and so you can't understand a single thing I'm writing down. But I'm doing what I can to try and learn as much as I can. But then we come off those mountaintop experiences. We get on the other side. We leave those conferences, those revivals, whatever it is, and we start to head home and we get back to our normal routine of life. Family issues get thrown at us, right? Job issues get thrown at us. Um, friends say something to us that we would have never expected them to say to us, Right? We have this awesome experience that we were just a part of and we felt the presence of God Almighty in our life. And it's like we hit a brick wall. God, where were you? Where are you in this moment? This is difficult. You just showed me this and, and I told you I'm going to be this way and I told you I'm going to live right and I told you I'm going to do things for you. God, where are you in this moment? Right? We hit that wilderness moment, this wondering, if you will. God, where are you? Many of us have experienced some other moments that may be more real uh, college, I, I was, ex no, I wasn't. I was terrified of going to college, right? I hated school, didn't want to go. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I went, right? Yeah, yeah. Glad I went. God did some awesome things in those moments when I went to college. A new job. How fearful it is sometimes to walk into a new place, to get to know new people and relearn things all over again, the way that they process the things, the way that they do, the way that they do things. A marriage. Whew. 
Those are great experiences. Kids, amen. amen. You realize you forget things within eight, year, eight years, right? Caden's born, you're like, oh, i got to relearn how to take care of a kid again, right? Some of it's like training wheels. You remember some of it, but a lot of it, you're like, I don't remember Chloe doing that. <laughs> Sierra says, oh, yeah. Like, I don't remember that part, right? Those are awesome experiences, but sometimes they can be accompanied by wilderness moments. We go to college. We graduate. Now, how are we going to pay for it? College is expensive right now, in case you didn't know that. New job, as awesome as it is, is it going to carry the benefits that I hope it, it, that I need, right? Marriage, as awesome as that is, you, you hit your first bump in the road. Is she right? Yes. But do I tell her that? No, right? Just playing. Just playing, right? Kids. They get older and they do stuff. How do you handle those things, right? Those are sometimes can be wilderness moments, especially when we let the anxiety of those things begin to creep in and overtake us and we try to fix things on our own and we push Christ out of the way. Those mountaintop experiences very quickly become wilderness moments if we, if we allow them to. I want to tell you that God is with us in those moments. One of the best examples of a wilderness moment that's followed by a mountaintop experience is the baptism of Jesus Christ. Jesus uh, is, again, this is my interpretation of what takes place on that day, but Jesus knows that John the Baptist is baptizing people and, and the Spirit of God leads him that way. He said he knows he's got he's to be baptized to show these people who he really is, that he is the Messiah, but he also is human, Right? And he's come to fulfill these things that we accept and that we realize in baptism, right? And so here Jesus is. He's standing in line, waiting his turn, and he is baptized. And the scripture says in Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. As soon as he comes out of the water, before his cloak is dry, the scripture says that he is sent, forced, put into the wilderness, right? I mean, almost at an instant. He's just heard this great declaration of, of who he is. This is my son, God says, who I am well pleased, right? He hears this awesome affirmation from his father and this, this, this baptism of the Holy Spirit that takes place. And then in a moment, he is thrown into the wilderness. Again, a literal place, but also a state of being. You can say what you want, but in those moments, that 40 days, that's where Christ learned to rely on his father. Amen. That's where Christ had to rely on God Almighty. Was Jesus God? Yes. Was he human? Yes. So naturally, there were some things that he had to learn along the way. Amen. In the wilderness moments, he had to rely on God and realize that God truly is with him as well. Last week, I shared with you a little bit about Elijah. Today, we're going to finish up that story, this encounter with Ahab and Jezebel as well, and how God was with Elijah in these moments. And this is kind of where our scripture is going to pick up in 1 Kings chapter 19. Again, if you have your Bible, I encourage you to turn there. We're going to kind of walk through the first 13, 14 verses of Elijah. I'm sorry, of uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. Again, keep in mind, this call that Elijah had was to prophesy to King Ahab who was not a God-fearing king. Uh, Elijah then challenged the God that Ahab and Jezebel served, who was Baal. Baal didn't show up the way that his prophets had hoped him to show up. But Elijah said that the one that answers by fire, that is the one whom we will serve, right? Elijah was basically saying, if Baal shows up with fire and consumes this offering, I'm willing to serve him. But until he does, I'm still serving my God. Amen? Amen? And so all this takes place. Fire falls from heaven, the Bible says, and, and it literally consumes the offering, sucks up all the water that, that, that drenched that offering. Uh, again, I believe that God showed up in such a way that there, were, there wasn't even any ash on the ground. Amen? God's a consuming fire, all right? And so there wasn't even any ash left for that offering. And so all this takes place, and then Elijah then goes off and he kills the prophets of Baal. Now, obviously, that didn't sit well with Ahab and especially Jezebel. Jezebel then looks at Elijah 
and basically says what you've just done to these prophets of Baal, I, by this time tomorrow, am going to do the same thing to you. Wow. Talking about being in a awkward moment, talking about it being in an unsure moment. Here you are, you're just doing what God told you to do. And, and then Jezebel looks at him and says, I'm fixing to do exactly what you have done to my prophets. First Kings verses three through five tells us that Elijah afraid for his life. Now listen to this. What did Elijah just experience? One of the most miraculous things that anybody has ever experienced before the way that God answered his prayer, right? And it was a short, simple prayer. God, I know who you are. I want you to show your, these people who you are, right? And that's what he does. He shows up in a mighty way. But it says that Elijah, afraid for his life, goes to Beersheba. Now, that's about 70 miles south of where he was at this, at this point in time. He left his servant there. So he goes down to Beersheba, leaves his servant there, and then goes another day's journey into where? The wilderness. Again, a physical place, but also a state of being physical place Elijah literally went to a barren land in hopes that nobody would follow him there because he didn't want to die but also spiritually in this moment he was wondering spiritually in this moment he was tired right afraid if you will to the point to where he even says this I've had enough Lord take my life I've had enough Lord take my life I'm sure there's some of us in here that have probably gotten pretty tired in our life that may have prayed that prayer. God, I'm done. Take it from me. Right? I've had enough of this world. I've had enough of this situation that I'm in. I've had enough of this being tired all the time. Just end it now, God. Elijah was physically and spiritually in the wilderness it's almost as if, again, he had forgotten all that God had done for him, providing him or providing for him in the midst of a famine, protecting him from a prophet murdering crazy woman, uh, answering the prayer as only God could in front of 850 witnesses of this false god, Baal. It was one of those, it was one thing after the other for Elijah. We talked about that last week. Literally, when God called Elijah, it was one thing after the other. He hardly had time to breathe. Amen? We feel like that sometimes. One hard time after another hard time for some of us. Amen. We get one thing taken care of and then boom, before we can even blink, there's something else that's happened. Right? right. Tired, frustrated, aggravated even. God, I'm doing what you've called me to do, but I'm, I'm just tired. I'm just worn out. And so Elijah was tired and ready for it all to be over to the point to where he asked for it to be over. Now here's how God works. God answered his prayer, but he didn't answer his prayer in the way that Elijah had specifically asked in this moment because God wasn't finished with Elijah. Amen? Aren't you glad that when we go through those difficult moments and those wilderness moments, we're glad that God doesn't just be done with us? Amen? He continues to help us in those moments and continues to call us and show us in those moments. And so if we continue in 1 Kings uh, verse, uh, chapter 9, verses 5 through 6, we see this all at once. The angel touched him. And said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was freshly baked bread. Can I get an amen on that one? Amen. Freshly baked bread and a jar of water. The Bible says that he ate it and he drank the juice or the water and then he laid back down again. There's something about fresh bread that just does something to you. Can I get an amen on that? When I was growing up, I was always excited when the church would say, oh, we're having a potluck this week. My, my great aunt, who's uh, passed on now, but uh, she always made this, this, this homemade uh, loaf of bread. The only issue was it was in about a tin, tin pan about this big, right? And we would all fight to see who would get a slice of her bread. They would try to, to cut it thinly, right? Because there was a lot of us. So they try to, to cut it thin like that didn't work because I always got two pieces. Can I get an amen? All right. And so when she passed on, I was upset because she was no longer living, but I was also upset because I wasn't going to have any more of her bread, right? Then my other aunt, she decided to learn how to make the bread, and guess what? We started having more of her bread. Can I get an amen? amen. Something special about freshly baked, baked bread. Say that ten times fast. That's kind of hard. 
So we, we would, as kids, you know, when I was growing up, they would let the, the elderly go first, and then they'd let the ladies, and then they'd let the men, and then sometimes the kids, right? Oh, I didn't like that. So I'd try and squeeze in wherever I could. Amen? Amen. Anybody else do that? Maybe that was just me. Hmm. Elijah woke up and he had freshly baked bread next to him in a jar of water. He ate the bread and he drank the water and then he laid back down. God, knowing that Elijah was tired, listen to this, provided rest for him in that moment. Gave him peace in that moment. Amen? And this physical place of desolation that that Elijah is now in, this dry place, this wasteland. And then also in this wondering moment in his life, God, I've done everything that I've asked you to do, but yet this is where I am. God, I want it to be done. And so what does God do? Slow down for just a moment, Elijah. Breathe. Get your rest. Calm down. Let me take care of you. Amen? Rest. Rest. God provided rest. And I'm not talking about just a cat nap. I'm talking about quality rest. Amen? Amen. I'm not a fan of cat naps because I like to nap. Amen? If I fall asleep for 10 or 15 minutes, I get mad because I want to fall asleep for an hour or two. We were at the beach one time. The only time we'd ever been to a beach for family vacation. We went down to a a friend's wedding. And then that afternoon, it was the day before the the wedding. That afternoon, we got back from the beach and we had a three-hour nap. That was the best nap I've ever had in my life. Amen? Amen? Sierra and I still talk about that. Man, I wish I had another three-hour nap. It was one of the great, greatest things that God ever allowed us to participate in. Quality rest. I know uh, a lot of us in here are football fans, but the last couple of years I've, I've started to, to enjoy soccer. I know. Calm down. It's all right. Breathe, right? Uh, I know that never, soccer's not everybody's cup of tea. I like the World Cup. I've been watching all those games. It's been fun to watch. The U.S. lost yesterday, but they put up a good fight. I know football's America's game, but soccer's the world's game, right? Uh, I came across this quote the other day from a, a, a famous soccer coach, and he says this, what separates a team from winning and losing is moments of quality. Think about that. What separates a team from winning and losing is moments of quality. Now, a soccer game is 90 minutes long, and if you run hard for that 90 minutes, you're going to tire out real quick. But there's a few minutes, maybe a two or three minute span where the ball's down by your net and you're going to push hard to try and score that goal. You're going to push hard for those quality moments, right? God is saying, I want to give you quality time with me. Amen? And those moments when you're running 90 to nothing, I just want you to slow up just a little bit so that you can sense me, so that you can hear me, so that I can feed you, so that I can quench your thirst for just, for just a moment. Amen. I want you to rest. In the midst of the wilderness, in the midst of not knowing which direction to go next, just sit there and do nothing and let me work for you. Amen? Next month is uh, Pastors and Spouse Retreat, and Sierra and I always look forward to that event, and we're looking forward to going to it next year. But one thing our, our, key, our DS does, Brother Keevan, he tells us to sleep. I love that. Our district superintendent says, when you come to... Pastor and spouse retreat. There's nothing planned all of Saturday. We have a breakfast time together and a, a, and a worship session. And in the, in the evening, we have a time of, uh, of sharing together in a, ses- in, a, in a meal. But between that, nothing is scheduled. Can I get an amen? Hey. Nothing. He tells us to leave our laptops at home. Don't prepare a sermon. He tells us to turn our cell phones off. He says, if you can't sleep, take a nap, rest. Bask in the glory of God. Yeah. Be in awe of Him yeah. for just a little while. Yeah. We all get tired every once in a while, right? We all get tired and frustrated. Can I tell you that rest is biblical? Psalm 23, He makes me lie down and He restores my soul. Yeah. You got to lay down before your soul can be restored, amen? You got to slow up a little bit. You got to rest for a moment. Psalm 46, Be still and know that I am God. And when we be still and know that he is God, the rest of that scripture says, I will be exalted among the nations. Amen? We're all too busy nowadays to slow down sometimes. We need to slow down so that we can exalt God in our nation. Genesis chapter 1, what did God do on the seventh day? Nothing. He rested. Amen? 
He had quality time for himself. He reflected on what he had done, and he was happy with it. Scripture says it was very good what he made. Amen? He rested. When we're in the wilderness, again, not sure what to do next, oftentimes we need that quality rest. Take a day or two to evaluate where you're at. Spend some time in prayer. Rest in God knowing that he is with you and helping you through this situation. That's what Elijah did for a few moments. He had to be forced to slow down and forced to stop, to eat this awesome bread, to drink this amazing water, right? And just be refreshed by God. Now listen to this. If we continue in verse 7, it says the angel of the Lord came back a second time. Now we don't know the time frame between the first time the angel came and the second time the angel came. The Bible doesn't talk about that. It could have been a day. It could have been a minute. It could have been two days. We don't know. We assume it happened pretty quick because it was a crazy lady after him, right? Those men in life, right? Those crazy ladies are after us. We want to get going, amen? So he, we don't know the time frame that's there, but the angel came back to him a second time. And he said, she said, get up. Or he said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and drank again. God gave him another loaf of bread. Amen. Carbon take for sure. Ready for that journey that's going ahead of him. Strengthened by the food. Bible says he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. Listen to this. So Elijah's refueled by God. He's been rested by God. He's been in awe of who God is. God has helped him be restored. And he runs. And what does he do? He runs to a cave. <laughs> right? Motivated, ready to go. And then the closer he gets, he realizes, hey, I'm running right back into the mouth of this lion. Right? He's a little nervous, runs into a cave. And then the word of the Lord came to him and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Elijah, uh, what are you doing here? I've given you the strength that you need. I've given you the rest. I've provided for you once again. I've revealed to you the next part of your call. Why are you in this cave? Elijah answered, I have a good excuse, God. The Israelites have rejected you and your covenant. They've torn down your altars and they've put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. Seems like a pretty good excuse, right? God wasn't satisfied with that answer, amen? He was the only one left. He had every excuse in the book to use. God said, I'm still going to use you, amen? You still have work to do, right? Your time is not finished yet. Verses 11 and 12, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord your God is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore through the mountains, and it tore them apart, and the rocks shattered. But God was not in the wind. After the wind came an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then after the earthquake came fire. Listen to this. Here Elijah is in this cave, right? In one of the mountains that's being shattered by the wind. Keep that in mind. I'd be freaking out, right? Here Elijah is in this mountain that's being shattered by this wind. And not only that, this earthquake happens. Begins to, he might see the ground begin to open up a little bit, thinking, all right, this is my time that I'm going to finally meet the Lord, right? And it may open up so much that lava, that fire begins to come up. God wasn't in any of that. God wasn't in any of that. The end of verse 12 says, after the fire came a gentle whisper. Amen. A gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. God was in this gentle whisper. In these moments of our life when things are just so busy and so loud, and you know what I mean by that. Everybody is trying to tell you something, right? Their opinions, facts, whatever it may be. Somebody is shouting something at you. When all the while God is whispering to you, God is saying, listen to me for just a little bit. When we're overwhelmed by this stress and this anxiety and this fear and this wondering of what we are to do next, may we rest in the shadow of the almighty. Amen. Amen. And like we talked about last week, may we quiet our minds and our hearts and may we look up to him and may we listen for the whispers. 
I put this at the end of your bulletin. I want to uh, help you understand this a little better. The devil shouts lies at you, right? He shouts lies at you. Everybody and their mama will tell you you're not good enough or something. The football games that happened yesterday, LSU lost 50 to 23. That quarterback's terrible, right? That running back can't hold on to the ball. That wide receiver can't catch his uh, football to save his life. Everybody wants to shout at him, right? Everybody wants to point out something when you do something wrong. But God is saying, I care for you, right? I want you to use this platform to glorify me, not them. I want you to uh, relax and, and, and rest in me so that I can work. So as the world is saying, you're not good enough and you'll never amount to anything or you're broken and the world knows it, right? People like to bring up stuff from the past. You remember when you did this? God is saying, I love you. God is whispering that truth to you. I love you. I'll take care of you. I'll uphold you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. As he says in Isaiah, I am with you. So yes, most of the time, mountaintop experiences are often accompanied by wilderness moments. But in those moments, may we not forget who God is. And we, we, may we not forget how God moves and how, we, how he wants to move. It's in these moments that God helps us realize that he is with us. And not only is he with us, but he's very near to us. Amen. Amen. Stand with me as we close in prayer today.